Thank you for that round of applause. <laughs> Just no, I'm tired. That's a joke. That's a joke. I realized how silent it was all of a sudden. This is the seventh week of us bringing attention to the specific, to seven specific desires that God has given us these specific desires and they can propel us towards a life of fulfillment. But way too often, as we've discovered for six weeks, we can have the tendency of taking these God-given desires and perverting them into something that is self-serving or self-destructive. And we've been learning that for six weeks, and today we're going to be bringing attention to the desire that God has given us to nourish our bodies, and then we can take that desire. We, we don't all do it. We, I think we've all had this experience, but the, the perversion of that desire to take in nutrition and turn it to gluttony. And I want to start with a, a note of clarity this morning. Greed, biblically, is about hoarding resources specifically. Lust is about sexual desire that we talked about a couple weeks ago. So when you're talking biblically and you speak about lust, you don't lust for a taco, okay? I mean, we all use that language, I lust for a taco right now, or I, I lust for that car. But that's not lust biblically. Biblically, lust is specifically about that sexual desire being driven to the point to where it becomes a sin issue. And I wanted to be clear on that because it's the same with gluttony. You do not glutton for punishment. That's not gluttony. You can use the phrase. I use the phrase. You're a glutton for punishment. I've said that to uh, my kids many, many times. You're a glutton for punishment, you know, right, as they're just amping up the level a little bit. That's not the biblical use of gluttony. You don't, you're not a glutton of someone's time. That's not gluttony. When you see the word gluttony in the scripture, it only means one thing, and that is, a, that is the abuse of that desire that God has given us to take on nourishment and enjoy our food. It is just about eating and drinking. It's not about anything else at all when you see gluttony in the Bible. It's about eating and drinking. Thinking, and we're going to unpack that a little bit today because that God-given desire, we need to eat. So in creating us, as with the other six desires, God has attached great enjoyment to eating and drinking to assure we have the drive in us to take in the nutrition we need. We all have that desire to do that. One of the great examples of, of I have of that driving desire is Zane and I, through his teenage years, did a lot of extended backpacking uh, where we would do, do trails and pack our food and stay out for multiple nights and all of that. And, and you'd be carrying a 35, 40-pound pack and covering miles and miles a day. And one of the things he said to me when he was about 16 years old, he said, you know what one of my favorite things about doing this is? And I said, uh, spending time with me. And he's like, that wasn't even on the list. And, no, that's a joke. He never said that. But he said, my favorite thing, one of my favorite things about doing this is after you have just gone and gone and gone carrying all of this in your backpack and, and, and going up hills and mountains and, and you're so exhausted you can't take it and we sit down to take a break and you just reach in and grab whatever snack for the trail that you packed with you. And he said, when I eat that, my whole brain and body thanks me. Right when I eat that. That's that drive for to drive to put food into our bodies. And, and, and when you have that experience of being completely depleted and, and you put that, uh, that food or that snack that you brought with you in your mouth, your whole body just says, ah, thank you so much for that. It's a very real God-given desire, and it is good. It is good to desire food, and it is good to take great joy in acts of eating and drinking on the screen. It is good to desire food and take great joy in acts of eating and drinking. It is a good thing. Eat your food with joy. Drink your wine with a happy heart, for God approves of this. Solomon in Ecclesiastes was giving a course correction to people who on their journey of life were storing up all of their wealth as if, as if, they were going to be able to take it with them or something like that. And Solomon gives them a little bit of correction and say, hey, man, enjoy this life that God has given you and blessed you with. Eat your food with joy. Drink your wine with a happy heart. For God approves of this. Then we get over to Matthew chapter 11. 
And we get to this other side food issue going on here in Matthew chapter 11. The religious leaders hated John the Baptist and they hated Jesus. And they hated them both and used food as accusations against both of them. They criticized John the Baptist because he fasted and he didn't drink wine. So the religious leaders criticized John the Baptist because he was fasting and not drinking wine. And then they turn around in 1119, Jesus, on the other hand, feasts and drinks, and they say, he's a glutton and a drunkard. They criticized John the Baptist for fasting and not drinking wine. They criticized Jesus for enjoying his food so much, going to dinner parties with people they didn't like, Drinking too much, or what they considered drinking too much. They criticized Jesus because he ate cheerfully and drank wine. And the reason they were criticizing him is because he was doing it with groups of people that they did not like. Their real objection to Jesus wasn't about how much he enjoyed being at dinner parties. What the religious leaders couldn't stand about Jesus was that his teaching exposed their hypocrisy. But in this snapshot in the New Testament, we see how people can do that. So why do we rarely to ever hear sermons on gluttony? I, I mean, most of us in here might have heard one or two sermons. Uh, for those of you who have been Christians and participating in church for a long time, you rarely to ever hear sermons on gluttony. I thought about this week, and th there's a lot of reasons for it. Uh, I, I'm, I'm, this is mine right here. I want you to tell me what to eat or drink. I want you telling me what to not eat and not drink. I mean, it's just, it just my default nature. Don't tell me what to eat. Don't tell me what to drink. I, I think we're also aware that none of us like that, that I think that causes us not to bring attention to the Scripture on it. I, I think another reason is because this kind of falls under the category of the, fruits of, of the fruit of the Spirit. And one of the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. So you can look at all seven things that we've talked about this week, and self-control would be a covering for all of those subjects, right? But if you only talk about self-control, you are ignoring the fact that all throughout Scripture... It brings attention to specificity of sloth and envy and anger and pride and lust. It, it, all throughout the scripture, it doesn't just go self-control, 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 self-control. Because we're all different, we all wrestle with different areas of self-control. So the scripture gets very specific about it. So, uh, so that's another reason. Pastors are afraid they'll hurt someone's feelings because so many people incorrectly believe that gluttony is about shape and size, and as you'll discover today, it's not. Pastors writing sermons are fully aware of the hang-ups that they have with food and have had with food and drink throughout their life. And because they're so fully aware of it, it causes us to just kind of pull away from the depth and wealth of Scripture about these specific things in Scripture like gluttony and just go back to let's do another sermon on self-control instead of getting into the specifics that can actually help us. So why should we hear more teachings and sermons on gluttony in the future? Because gluttony specifically covered dozens of times through the Old Testament and the New Testament, through all of Scripture, the specificity of envy, the specificity of lust, the specificity of gluttony is mentioned in Scripture and taught in Scripture. It's taught about, gluttony is taught about throughout the entire Scripture. We see it used as an accusation against people multiple places in Scripture. We see gluttony used as a metaphor at different places in Scripture. Multiple times we see the specificity of gluttony warned against. And we see the teachings in Scripture 
about the harms and the motivation of gluttony does to our lives, to our spiritual lives, on all seven of these, these God-given desires that we have are good until we pervert them into something that they were not intended to be, and then they all become bad, and they all deserve attention to say, how can we bring all of these things back? And of all the passages on gluttony, And there are many more than the ones that I emailed you this week to do a little pre-reading. My main goal of that was to help you see it's all throughout Scripture in different ways and different forms. But for us this morning to, to to just land here for a little bit of time, this passage in Numbers 11 teaches us a lot, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell us a little bit about it. And the Israelites and the others who escaped Egypt with them are on this 40-year circular journey through the wilderness. And let me tell you the story and unpack it for you a little bit. Along with the Israelites escaping from Egypt were some other people who were living in Egypt, some other foreigners who were traveling with the Israelites who began to crave the good food that they had in Egypt, and the people of Israel also began to complain. So now the Israelites are complaining. We're dying for something different. We're dying for something different. We would do anything just to have some meat. Because God had been supplying them with manna each and every day, and manna looked like small coriander seeds that you have in that little jar in your spice cabinet. And it was pale yellow and like a resin gum. And the people would go out and they would gather it each morning. When God provided it every single morning, they'd go out and gather it. And then they would grind it into flour. They would boil it into a pot and they would make these bread cakes out of this manna every single day. God was providing for them while they're traveling in the wilderness. And the scripture even tells us it tasted like flat bread and honey. Come on now. They are getting Bob Evans biscuits and gravy delivered to them in the wilderness every single day. And now they're saying, we want something different, God. This isn't good enough. We want meat too. So in verse 5 in Numbers 11 says, we remember the fish we used to eat for free in Egypt. They were slaves being fed to have energy to do slave labor with the food that was available in Egypt. And now here they are having biscuits and honey delivered to them every day. And they're complaining about, hey, the food we had when we were slaves was better than this food that God's providing for us. They go on to say in verse 5, and they're reminiscing, they're thinking about their slave days and we had all the cucumbers. Melons, leeks, onions, and garlic we wanted, but now our appetites are gone. All we ever see is this stupid bread that tastes like biscuits and honey. (laughs) Moses heard all the families standing in the doorways of their tents complaining and whining, the scripture says. And the Lord became angry. And Moses was also aggravated with the people. And Moses also complained to God. And in verse 13, and and part of his complaint to God, which was also about other things, he said, where am I supposed to get meat for all these people? They keep whining to me, saying, give us meat to eat. And Moses says to God, "I, I can't carry all these people by myself. This load is too heavy. If this is how you intend to treat me, just go ahead and kill me now. Do me a favor. Spare me the misery. And here are the people of Israel who are being fed by God every single day, flatbread and honey flavor. Every single day they're being fed this, right? And they're complaining about it. And the complaints of all these people are aggravating Moses. And all of this tension is happening because there's a very large group of hangry people. But you see, they're not just hangry from hunger because their bellies have never went empty. They, 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 just, they just want more variety. They just want something different. Verse 31, now the Lord sent a wind and brought quail from the sea. 
to let them fall around the camp. For miles in every direction, there were quail flying about three feet off the ground. So the people went out and caught quail all day. Then throughout the night and all the next day too, no one gathered less than 55 gallon, 10 55 gallon drums of quail. Imagine 55 gallon oil barrels. Now imagine 10 of them. Now imagine that you have filled all of those with meat. That was the families who had gathered the least amount of quail, the meat that they had been asking for. They spread the quail all over the ground and camped to dry. And the scripture says, but while they were gorging themselves on the meat, while it was still in their mouth, God was upset with these petulant, gluttonous Israelites, and he struck them with a severe plague. So that place was named Graves of Gluttony, because that is where they buried the people who had craved meat from Egypt. Is their desire for meat the problem? Feel free to answer correctly or incorrectly. It's a yes or no question. Is their desire for meat the problem? No. Genesis chapter 9, we're told that God has given us the, the plants of the earth to eat. He's given us the animals of the earth to eat, and, and we're welcome to eat it. You are welcome to be a vegetarian. If you want to be a vegetarian, God bless you. Nothing wrong with that. But you're not doing it for biblical reasons, okay? Okay. You're welcome to be a carnivore. I toyed with the carnivore diet this year, and I just could not bring myself to do it. Any of you at least for 72 hours do the carnivore diet or 24 or something? Let me see. Okay, all over the room. Yeah. I, Nate Porter did it. How long you do it, Nate, the carnivore diet? Was it three days or something like that or two weeks? Did, yeah. Nothing wrong with that. I couldn't bring myself to do it. I was like, no. Nah. Well, you can do the carnivore diet for whatever reasons you want to do it. You're not doing it for biblical reasons. Because God has given it all for us to eat. So them wanting meat was not the problem. Is the problem that they want to enjoy their food? That they're just tired of the same old menu and they're ready for something different? Was that the problem? Nope. The whole of Scripture contains the blessing to enjoy your food and wine, to gladden the heart, and bread to strengthen the heart. The whole of Scripture gives us that blessing to enjoy the food, this desire that God gives us to nourish ourselves, that drive that he gives us. And then as we fulfill that drive, there can and should be enjoyment in it. As I mentioned earlier, Jesus participated in feasts and dinner parties, so much so that he was accused of being a glutton and a drunkard, and he was not either one of them. And Paul teaches us in 1 Timothy 4, there's no list of food or drink that should or should not be eaten. I'll tell you what, in my direct messages, in my email, in the post I did on this, had like 50 comments or more on it. So many people are, are joking about and saying, you're not going to tell us to not eat this, are you? You're not going to tell us to not eat this, are you? You're not going to tell us to eat this, are you? You're not going to tell us to eat that and not eat that, are you? So for an object lesson today in scriptural teaching, we're having an ice cream bar after this message on gluttony. Because there is no list of food or drink that should or should not be eaten. That's not what defiles you. It wasn't that they wanted the meat. It wasn't that they wanted something different than Bob Evans' biscuit and honey. So why is God upset with the people to the point that he sent a plague, so many of them died that they named the place Graves of Gluttony. And in verse 4 of 11 of Numbers, we see that their discontent is revealed. We used to have it good before we were following Yahweh to where he wanted to take us into the land that he has promised us where there will be what? Awesome food. 
where there'll be awesome food in that land. So God is trying to take them to the place that's going to be a blessing for them. And they're saying, we used to have it good before we were following Yahweh to where he wants to take us. What good is God doing for us when all we have to eat is this stupid manna? Their desire for food variety is yet another sign of their lack of desire to follow God through anything challenging for them at all. To follow God through anything that steps on their personal comfort that they're used to. We would rather go back and have onions and leeks and fish as slaves in Egypt than sit here and eat this great tasting bread all the time. Gluttony had reduced their journey to freedom to the pursuit of something different to eat. The spiritual journey to literally freedom as a nation had driven them to the place of they weren't concerned about that as much as they were concerned about the menu instead of what God was already providing for them. They had gotten the God-given desire to eat, to nourish the body, and enjoying eating. They got it disordered. They got it disordered. That's the theological term I'm going to use for perverted. All of these things that we've been talking about for seven weeks are these God-given desires that he's given us. But the second we allow them to become perverted, the second we allow them to become disordered in our life from the way that the creator ordered them, then they become a problem and gluttony is no different. And it's no different for the Israelites in Numbers chapter 11. That their journey through the wilderness, a lot happened there, a lot to teach on, a lot to study, a lot to preach on. But one aspect you will never be able to get away from is that their gluttony was a part of a spiritual problem that the nation had with God in Numbers chapter 11. So how does eating and drinking get disordered in our life? Because... Eating is to be ordered for nourishment. Eating is to be ordered for nourishment. Food itself, Timothy, Jesus, Genesis 9, other places, food itself is not ordered or disordered. So this is where some of you have the yeah, what abouts in your mind and you're jumping to different parts of Scripture like don't eat this and don't eat that and don't drink. Throughout the history of Scripture, God uses Everything around us, including a tithe, God uses everything around us, including food. God uses everything around us, including a Sabbath, to, in our life, illustrate different things for us from time to time throughout Scripture, to teach us different lessons about it. But anytime God told John the Baptist what to do and to take take the Nazarite vow, anytime you see in the Old Testament God telling people what not to eat and what to eat, it was based on something that he was teaching them or doing in their life for that period of time, but it was not the food in and of itself that was the issue. So food in itself is not ordered or disordered. It's just food. And that's why the Apostle Paul, when they had all this trouble in the New Testament between they're eating this and that meat might have been sacrificed to that and they're drinking this wine and that wine might have been gathered this way and that's a problem here and that's a problem. And the Apostle Paul says it's not the food, it's not the drink that you're putting in your mouth that defiles you. I have to make a big note right here on this one. I'm not making a statement about anything. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not doing theology here. I'm just pointing out an observation that Greg McNichols has made while working on this, that it's not the food that goes in your mouth that defiles you. As we're taught that in Scripture, we did not have a hundred years of an industrial nation that can take things that are actually not food on any level in God's world and make it food for you to eat, Okay. So that doesn't mean if they can take strychnine and make you a cupcake solely out of strychnine that the Bible says that's okay to eat. So I think that note is very important. That is, the Scripture teaches us that, that it's not the food that, doesn't, that defiles you. It doesn't mean that they can't take that chair on, on uh, 
those silly British baking shows that you guys watch and use the fabric of that chair and work it into a cake through some kind of processing and then you eat a cake with the fabric of that chair in it, it doesn't mean that. It means the food that God gives us is not what defiles you. I think that's a really important note in the history of, of, of American food specifically. Food being ordered towards nourishment and what we see in Numbers chapter 11 is about our desire. Combined with your act of eating, something can be ordered or disordered. This is for the whole series here on the next slide. Desire drives you to an action that aims to an end. Desire drives you to an action that aims to an end. So the desire to take on nourishment and enjoyment drives you to eat not what types of food, not even necessarily what amounts of food. We have all different genetics and family histories and metabolisms and, and, and shapes and sizes and all of that. It's not about that. It's not for anyone else to judge about that. We're all different in that in this world. But desire drives you to an action to take on nourishment and enjoy that nourishment, but if part of what you enjoy in your nourishment is the fabric of that chair baked into your thing, you got something you're going to want to deal with there. Any of you watch that, that just awesomely twisted show where people eat weird objects? Like I watched a lady, eat, was, uh, you know, it's a, they, they have some kind of disorder and they eat couch cushions and they, they eat, you know, car seats and different. Uh, anyway, am I the only one in here? I, I don't even know what channel it's on. It's 10, 15 years ago. I remember that. <laughs> toilet paper, eating toilet paper. You remember that one? Oh, disgusting. But did the desire to take on nourishment that God has given us drives us to the action of taking on that nourishment like Jesus did at dinner parties and feasts and enjoying it while we're doing it. But once the nourishment that that body requires has been taken on to be properly ordered, then we go on with our lives. So listen to this. Desire drives you to action, or desire drives you to action, and the action aims to an end. Listen to this one. If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become loaves of bread. Right? Satan to Jesus at the beginning of his ministry, in the temptation, one of the temptations. After 40 days of fasting, you have the ability to provide bread for yourself, so go ahead and provide it for yourself. Now remember, Jesus was about to spend years at dinner parties eating and drinking. Jesus was about to spend years at parties feasting. So Jesus, after 40-day fast, could have provided bread for himself. That wasn't the issue. It wasn't about the bread Jesus could have provided for himself, that would have brought disorder to his eating on that day, it would have been, why am I providing this bread for myself to eat it on this day? And that is to submit to the authority of this one who wants to see my downfall. I think, I think that's a powerful reminder that it's not about what you are eating or what you are drinking, but, but gluttony is about why are you doing it? Is what you're about to eat or drink ordered towards nutrition and enjoyment? Add ice cream out there, yeah, we can pack way more sugar in it now than we probably should pack into our ice cream here in America. Sure, we can do it. We can pack way more sugar into our drinks and our life, our food, all that stuff. I, I get that. It, it's, it's not about that. It's about taking that on, enjoying it. Like a dinner party with Jesus, having a good time today. It's not about what it is. But why and how much you're eating and drinking is what 
disorders that desire for food and drink to the sin of gluttony. And that's where the Israelites were. They had all kinds of other spiritual issues going on. We, we understand that, right? There are a lot of other things going on, and the this, this journey through the wilderness was not about food or gluttony, but it was a symptom of what was going on in the rest of all of those other areas of life. And the Scripture calls attention to it to the point that it says this plague God put on them and put many of them in their graves because of their gluttony, but their gluttony was a result of their disobedience and their trust in God. And that's not the issue for all of us. That's not the point I'm making. What I'm asking is why and how much you are eating and drinking is what perverts the desire for food and drink and the sin of gluttony. I want the band to go ahead and come on up. And I, and I want to ask you that question. I know what it was for, for, for Greg. Throughout my life, it's lack of self-control specifically. It's, it's that taking something on and, and eating it, and as soon as I'm eating it, I'm like, oh, Moses, that's good. And then I'd have some more of it, and I'd have some more of it, and then I'd have some more of it. And when I was 45, I'm like, wow, this is not going to serve me well to make it to 100. And I had to do some real soul searching on myself, and I realized for me it, it was self-control. There are others of you in here that, People would envy to have your metabolism, and there you are standing, like my dad, maybe at 6'8 and 112 pounds or whatever he is, and, and, and you're a glutton. You're a glutton just like anybody else is a glutton. So it's not about that. It's about the spiritual journey between you and God to look at the specifics of this in the Scripture like I had to. I think in, in, in Numbers 11, is more attention on food than God that was part of that problem. God's trying to take them to the land of milk and honey, but because they didn't have it then, their attention was more on food than it was on God. We all know this. I'm not telling you anything now you don't know. Is it comfort? Is it comfort that causes you to grab that extra bag of carrots or Twinkies or bowl of cereal or that extra steak or that extra sweet potato? Because it's not about that food. It's about why. Why is it going? Is it trauma? Sometimes it is. We know that. Is it to kill time? We all, know, we all kill time or have killed time with food in our lives. That's not ordered. That's, that's not eating for nutrition enjoyment. That's to kill time. So now, for you, it's gluttony at that moment in time, and the Holy Spirit wants to check you on it. Is it mindlessness? Do you know we are living in the exact same place that the Israelites were when they just wanted some meat? And now they got it flying around three feet high, 55-gallon drums of it stacked everywhere. So what did they do? The word the Scripture uses is they gorge themselves with it. And that's the challenge that we have. We live in a country of food stacked three feet high everywhere we go. So we just mindlessly keep putting it in our mouth and putting it in our mouth. The Holy Spirit wants you to stop and take mind of that. Is it reward or punishment? It's a challenge. Is it to manage your emotions? Is that why you're taking the extra drink, is to manage your emotions? That's a problem. There, I, I could have written four more sermons on gluttony today to go all of the different directions and, and important places that we could go on this, on, on genetics, on addiction, on, on different things like that. But the goal of this series was to help us grow strong in our faith to say that God doesn't simply stop at saying, well, the answer is Jesus. And then he doesn't simply stop at saying, well, the answer is Jesus. Now, just receive the Holy Spirit. And he doesn't stop there. And he doesn't stop with, well, just receive the Holy Spirit and start, he moves on from there. It says, now start dealing with the issues in your life that are not like Christ. And then he moves on from there and says, is lust a problem for you? And works through it. Is envy a problem for you? Is gluttony a problem for you? And he gets so specific for us that there is help for every single one of us to see that when we take this thing of eating and drinking 
and we take the disorder of it in our lives, whether it's comfort, trauma, kill time, mindlessness, reward, mindlessness, reward punishment, manage emotions, lack of self-control, more attention to food and God, and 10 other ones that it could be, we can take that disorderedness of our life and through the help of friends and scripture and encouragement and working together, Eating and drinking can be some, become something that is disordered in your life this morning or from time to time and become something that is consistently ordered in your life and you will love it. You'll, you'll, you'll absolutely love it. And that's why we've been so excited to do this series for seven weeks. Let's stand. Is because we all carry these desires that the scripture gets specific about that we can pervert them, we can disorder them. But the path is very clear on each and every one of them how to get those back in the order for which God created them, and it will bring blessing and fulfillment to our life. I didn't say it'd make your life easier. I didn't say it'd make you rich. I didn't say it, you'd automatically be healed of whatever you need to be healed of. I said it will bring you a life of fulfillment with Christ and the people around you, and you will stop doing damage to the people around you when you take these seven things and say, God, how do I unpervert these? How do I take these things? that I have disordered and bring them back into the order that you gave me. Help me with this, Lord. Help me with this body of Christ. Amen? Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you so much for sharing the scripture with us today and these teachings that your scripture is so clear about. We want to grow in you and not point the finger at anybody else. Whatever we need to deal with, God, we deliver it to you today. Help us grow. Give us the ability to to, to pray with someone on our prayer team. Give us the courage to reach out to someone for encouragement and motivation and maybe a little more teaching and guidance in these areas that we've been talking about for seven weeks. We want to be a church that helps each other and we do not ignore what the scripture shows us. We thank you so much in your name. Amen.